White House in Washington, a guard of honor stands at salute in honor of a distinguished visitor, President Edward Benesch of Czechoslovakia. Accompanied by Secretary of State Cordell Hull, President Benesch greets President Roosevelt and is introduced to the President's daughter, Mrs. Anna Bettiger. Members of the cabinet extend a hearty welcome to the visitor. One of the great leaders of pre-war Europe and a fervent defender of democratic traditions, President Benesch works unceasingly to free his nation from the yoke of Nazi Germany. A second distinguished visitor arrives at the White House. On the heels of the Allied victory in Tunisia, Prime Minister Winston Churchill arrives in Washington for his fifth wartime conference with President Roosevelt and a discussion of plans for the next moves against the Axis. Canadian lumbermen climb to dizzy heights to lop off the tops of the world's largest spruce trees. These mammoth trees yield the finest lumber for aircraft construction that can be obtained. The Queen Charlotte Islands and other forests in British Columbia and Alaska are the chief sources of supply for Canadian and American lumber industries. tons of giant spruce, but it's the strongest light wood in the world. Canadian women replace the traditional lumberjacks in some jobs. These girls work long, hard hours to get out the wood for the Allies' fastest bombers. From the forest to the mill, and then on to the railroads to take their part in the United Nations' assault on the Axis. Twenty-five years ago in Washington, President Woodrow Wilson inaugurated the first regular airmail service. The first regular flight between the nation's capital and New York City was a tribute to the pioneering vision of the men of a quarter century ago and led to the vast network of modern airlines and airmail routes. Today, Washington celebrates the Silver Jubilee of the foundation of the airmail. A new helicopter is the basis of the Postal Service's newest facility, the direct pickup at central points in cities and towns for fast delivery to the large airports. In front of the Capitol at Washington, Igor Sikorsky, designer of the new helicopter, sees his invention carry a special packet of mail to the Washington airport. In the 25 years of its existence, the airmail has grown beyond all expectations, totaling 45 million pounds in a single year. There will be more airmail helicopters after the war. Today, because of their amazing maneuverability, helicopters are under secret army and navy orders. One hundred and fifty tons of molten steel pour from an open hearth furnace at Henry J. Kaiser's new steel mill in California. This is the first steel ever produced on America's west coast and is indicative of the constantly expanding war industry of the United States. Kaiser, miracle man of merchant ship construction, witnesses the tapping from the first of the six furnaces, now furnishing steel for the sinews of war. Long lines 
dreams of new heavy tanks bear witness to the need for steel and more steel. Here is one of the many tank depots which stretch across the American continent. Tanks finished, armed, and ready for shipment to the battlefronts of this global war. Action in the Aleutian Islands. With a well-established operations base at Amchitka Island, American troops practiced the invasion tactics which landed them on the Jap-held island of Attu. Cooperation between the Army and the Navy was responsible for the successful assault on this Jap-held island. Transport crews, gun crews, and troops in landing barges, everyone concerned, carry out the intricate operation designed to wrest the North Pacific Island bases of Attu and Kiska from the Jap. Actual landings like this one have put American forces within bombing range of the Japanese mainland. In New Guinea, Boston bombers and bow fighters of the Royal Australian Air Force take off from an island air base to attack strong points still in Japanese hands on the northeast coast. Driven out of Papua, Small Jap units still hang on tenaciously to jungle outposts. The Australian Air Force constantly bombs and strafes them. Jap positions at Mubo in a steep-sided ravine, the Australians drive in fearlessly. Another blow against the Japs, foreshadowing the big drives to come. Somewhere in China, the 14th Air Force sees the second star of a major general pinned on the shoulder of their popular commander, General Claire Cheneau. In turn, the general decorates heroes among his flying officers. This captain crashed in enemy territory, but made his way back safely to his base. Chinese pilots trained in the United States are attached to the force and congratulated by General Cheneau. Pacific strategy calls for the rapid increase of air force striking power in China. In Washington, for strategic conferences, General Cheneau receives the Mitchell Trophy for outstanding air achievement. His leadership of the famous Flying Tigers, who, as volunteers with the Chinese, harassed the Japs for months before Pearl Harbor. Following the complete collapse of Axis resistance in Africa, the Allied Air Force, based in Egypt, Malta, and Tunisia, pounds the shores of Italy's islands and the mainland of Italy itself. Flying fortresses streak across the Mediterranean to slash at Naples, Sicily, and Sardinia. Weak anti-aircraft fire doesn't stop this round-the-clock bombing of these stepping stones to the Allied invasion of Europe. Allied wings over Axis Europe. 